As I mentioned, no single tool is sufficient to evaluate all the components of competence. But here's the other piece of this. Pick the best combination that meets your needs in the context of local resources. Importantly, think more in terms of methods and less in terms of tool. By that I mean pick a method and then make it as feasible and use it as well as you possibly can. For example, direct observation is a method. It's critical to use direct observation, but there are all kinds of tools out there you could use, such as the mini clinical evaluation exercise, a tool that's been well studied, but may not be the best one for you. Although I would recommend you take a look at that, the point here is pick the method that you best need to use and then find a tool that works best for you. Remember that nothing ever works perfectly, and so you're going to have to embed continuous quality improvement into the evaluation system. One good way to think about tools when you're choosing which particular tool to use is to use this utility index from Case van der Vluten from Maastricht Holland. I find this to be a very helpful kind of construct in thinking about, geez, I want to use a mini CEX. Is it a good tool? Well, you can use utility index. And here you can see utility is the product of validity, reliability, acceptability, educational impact and cost effectiveness. And again, in the context in which it's being used. In the context is the sum of the microsystems, such as wards, emergency department, clinics, etc., where the tool is being used. Now, validity simply refers to the fact, is the tool measuring what it's supposed to measure? And does it tell you something about the individual's performance that's truly aligned with the construct or skill it's supposed to measure? Reliability is about fairness. Tools should be reliable so that if you repeat the tool on multiple occasions, you should theoretically get similar results. Acceptability is also important. If it's not acceptable to the person using it, in this case the faculty using a mini CX, they're not going to use it. And so it's important to make sure that they understand it and that it's acceptable to them. Finally, given that formative assessment is so important, in competency-based microeducation, you want to make sure the tool has true educational impact, that it catalyzes future learning. That's very important. And finally, it does need to be cost-effective. Doing good assessment does take some time, and you want to maximize the cost-effectiveness of whatever tool you might use. Simulation, for example, is a wonderful technique when it's used well, but it's expensive. So you'd want to choose it to really target specific competency where it's best suited to do that and you maximize your return on investment for the use of that simulation. A good example is what Diane Wayne has done at Northwestern, where they use simulation to teach the insertion of central lines until a trainee reaches a certain level of mastery before they're allowed to actually insert central lines in real patients. And what they have found is that by doing that, they have reduced complication rates for patients on the teaching service. And so the return on investment for the use of simulation in that context and for that particular competency, in this case a procedural skill, is wonderful. And so I'd encourage you to think about how that cost effectiveness plays into your choice of the particular tool. This wiring diagram is just simply a way to think about how you might use these tools. And the reason I put this up is that you can see in this case there are six different assessment methods that easily cover the six general competencies, but you'll also notice that these tools cover multiple competencies, and that's an important theme here. Pick tools that you can repurpose or get twofers for. For example, a medical record audit with a quality improvement project is about systems-based practice, as well as about practice-based learning and improvement, and even patient care. Here's the other nice part about that. It's something that the trainee can do themselves. That's why it's in red. The three assessment methods listed in red are all things a trainee should and can do. The faculty don't need to do this. And I think that's a really important observation here. You want to pick assessments where the trainees have some responsibility for them. EBM stands for evidence-based medicine. You can have the trainees collect a question log to see how well they're applying evidence-based medicine skills. And so that becomes their responsibility, not yours. And then you can see that for the others that are the responsibility of the training program, 
They all require some form of direct observation, such as faculty evaluations, mini-CX, or multi-source feedback. That's what MSF stands for. But all these things have done on a routine basis, no more, as you can see, than once a month for mini-CX, only twice a year for multi-source feedback, and your monthly faculty evaluation forms, combined with the assessments performed by the trainees, you can see that you get a very robust picture of how a trainee is performing. And all this information can actually be fed into a structured portfolio that can then be used by both the trainee, the trainee's advisor, and by the conference committee to make good decisions. Now, in order to make this system work well, you're going to need faculty development. It is very unlikely you can create a successful assessment system without faculty training. This is a critical point. Evaluation tools are only as good as the individual using them. And whether we like it or not, there are no magic bullets. At the present time, we still need faculty judgment. It would be wonderful if you could stick your trainee in the assessment scanner and out popped the information you needed to make a good judgment. We don't have that. And so faculty are a critical piece of this and they need to be trained in assessment evaluation. It is not an innate skill. Like everything else, it takes practice and feedback to do it well. And so you're gonna to need to make this investment. And in order to do faculty development, again, you need the shared mental models and understanding of the competencies. And there are a number of techniques, again, that I won't have time to get into today, that have been found to be helpful to faculty, such as performance dimension training, frame of reference training, and behavioral observation training that allows them to develop these shared mental models that can be done in small aliquots of time and can be done over a period of time. For example, building 15 to 20 minute discussions into department meetings can be a very good way to get some shared understanding around key competencies or entrustable activities that everybody's responsible for evaluating, such as that intern reaching six months of their internship. Are they really ready to see patients without direct supervision? That's something that all people can get a handle on and work on together. I mentioned the committees and how important they are. Not only are they important for making good judgments, but you, again, you can use them to develop group goals, you can use them for faculty development, and you can also use the committee to deal with difficult trainees. When you have a trainee in trouble, you need the group. No single individual should have to do this on their own. Competency committees will need accessible information. And again, and again, they're a key receptor site for the framework and milestone so that you can synthesize the multiple assessments to make an overall judgment. So I'm going to stop there. Um, I want to thank you for uh, your attention today. I hope this has been helpful. Uh, all of us are struggling with this new language and really this new conception of what medical education needs to look like in this outcomes-based era. I'd encourage you to read some of the literature that's been uh, produced over the last year from groups like the International Collaboration on Competency-Based Medical Education. Um, I think that's very helpful. And certainly a number of the reform reports like Educating Doctors, the Carnegie Report from Molly Cook, Dave Irby, and Bridget O'Brien is a wonderful book that can provide some additional detail. So thank you for your attention, and I wish you all the best.